Hello, beloved. I'm greeting you in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, the soon coming Messiah. It is a pleasure, folks, always to be with you. To break, break together. Let us start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you as it is called today. We honor you. We give you the praise and the glory. Father, our hearts are filled with joy, with excitement, because you are in our lives and that you are in control of every situation. Father, we look to you for our sustenance. Our help comes from the Lord. Our help does not come from men, does not come from the hills, but it comes from the maker of the heavens and the earth, the keeper and the maker of Israel. And so we put our trust in you. And so, Lord, give us bread, give us food that will sustain us and strengthen us in these times that we're in, that we may be filled with joy and with love and with your purpose and presence. Amen and amen. Folks, day two um, of this series that I feel the Lord has placed upon me called the Catching Away of the Church slash Bride into Glory. Catching Away of the Church into Glory. I was just thinking the other day that um, how we listen to music, especially secular music. When you listen to a song and it keeps and you keep listening to it, eventually it grows on you. And it begins to marinate in you and you begin to meditate on it and until you become that song. This usually happens with secular song, music. I've noticed that, you know, with a lot of people. But when it comes to the things of God and hearing the word, we are, our flesh is resistant. We are dull. And we, you know, we, we hear something once and we're like, okay, fine, I've heard it already. I don't want to keep hearing it. And I know that you may have heard me say this message over and over again. <laughs> But you will have to bear with me because this is the message that is in my spirit. This is the message of the hour. This is that which the Lord has instructed me to speak to his people. Somebody needs, out there needs to hear this again and again. They need to be reminded. John the Baptist uh, preached one message. Prepare, you know, the kingdom for the kingdom of God is at hand. Um, and that's all that he had to do was to announce the coming of Jesus then 2,000 years ago. And so this is what I have to do also. I have to announce a message that the Lord has given me in this season because I feel that it is, it is, uh, it is potent, it is urgent, um, it is, the rupture is imminent. And so I have to come again and again to remind us, to remind us once again to stay the course, to stay, this, uh, to stay in the state and the straight and narrow. So today I want to touch on a different dimension like I touched yesterday. I will come also to the book of Songs of Solomon and read again. But I, the Lord has been, like I said, there's been so many things and I'm just having to go by God's prompting here, by the Holy Spirit's prompting, so that I bring everything that I must bring. I want to talk about what is happening generally around us is indicating that our spiritual posture must now shift. Our spiritual posture must look at a certain way, must be in a certain way of thinking, way of doing things, okay? The whole concept of preparing for the coming of Christ is a spiritual posture. That's what it is. It, is means, that, it means that you have changed your affection, one. Your passion, the things that you are passionate about has shifted. It means that your business has changed, has shifted. If your heart and your strength was invested in something that is different, it now has to shift towards the preparation or the anticipation of the coming of Christ because it is a, it is a, it is a heart condition that's at play here more than, in, more than anything else. The events that are taking place are meant to recondition us, the way we feel, the way we look, the way we understand, to begin to focus, to zero in, or to be uh, you know, aligned to a heavenly sort of perspective. Just, you know, when you're trying to focus your, your, your television, you know, to the, to the network, and you're trying to make sure that it's right on alignment. That's exactly what it, what we, we, where our spiritual, uh, you know, laser should be it should be focused it should come into alignment into the straight and narrow of god where all that we are now anticipating is that and by so by doing that we are actually without realizing that we are preparing the condition of our heart because we are removing anything and everything 
that we feel hinders us from connecting with God. So that is the position that the church of Jesus Christ needs to be. She needs to be uh, in deep love, in a deep love position where she can't wait to meet her groom. She cannot wait uh, to, be, to, to, to gaze her, uh, his face. The church needs to be in this position, in this spiritual posture. That's why we find in the book of Luke chapter 21, from verse 25, when we are told that there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Why are these signs necessary? Because they are there, the perplexities, the, the troubles, the chaos that's taking place. It is meant to help us know the times, number one, so that we can then make the necessary preparation to condition ourselves and to change our posture. Because if you then look at verse 28, it says, when you see these things taking place, when you see the chaos that is taking place in the world, then what you need to now do is not get involved with the world, it's not to get concerned or to jump on the bandwagon with the world, but you, however, need to change your posture. You need to look up. You need to change your focus. You need to now refocus to the coming of the Messiah because your redemption, it means that your redemption is drain nigh. That's all that it means. So you must change your posture. And then if you keep reading and then you go to verse 34 to verse 36, we are then also even inst instructed to keep watch to keep watch because we don't know when the son of man is going to come so we must always keep watch we must then be alert it's like almost saying change the way you've been doing things if you're just doing generally change that and become more uh you know purposefully make it a priority now if you're doing it for 10 minutes now do it for 20 minutes if you're doing it for 20 minutes now do it for an hour and so on because you have to change the way you were doing things because something is about to take place and that something for it to take place it must find you in a certain condition in a certain position that is aligned looking up not horizontal but vertically i, I pray that is loud and clear so our spiritual posture here is what is being required by the things that are taking place, by the, the, the pressures, by the, the cooking that is, that, you know, the burdens and the trouble that is taking place in our spirits. We feel this burden because we are being asked to change the way we are looking. We are in, in fact, we are instructed. It's an instruction of God that we should anticipate the coming of the Messiah. A lot of Christians have this naivety that is just going to happen when it happens oh when it wants to happen then it will happen uh, that's what it is you, you know what folks i i used to be like that as well until the lord started showing me deep things about walking with him and intimacy with him a real level of intimacy and the kind of people that he's coming back for he's coming back for the first fruit what is a first fruit a first fruit is that if you grow i, I like to do farming and when you're growing tomatoes they are those kind of tomatoes that start to show a, a certain color. They change their color from green and start getting yellowish, orangish, you know, because it is, it can be one or two in the midst of the whole plant. We call those the first fruit because they go ahead of the rest. Okay, so they are screaming now to be picked because they are saying, I got there first. When, you, when, the, when, when, when we talk of first fruit, we're talking about that fruit that, uh, that, that, that ripens first before all the rest of the, of the field is, is ripe. Okay, those are the kind of people that Jesus are coming for. The kind of first uh, fruit is the kind of fruit that doesn't need a lot of, you know, coxing. Doesn't need a lot of, you know, labor and energy to, to get it to get there. It's sort of like it's a way ahead of the pack because it is, I don't know how God has created things, you know, for, for, for them to be like that. But I believe, you know, this is in tandem with this particular scripture that talks about the first fruit. So the first fruit doesn't need a lot of convincing. It is there. It is. Oh, and it's always the little minimum. It's not a lot. It's not the whole field. It's just a handful. Okay, so when we talk about Jesus coming for the first fruit, it's those kind of people who have an intimate love relationship that they don't necessarily need persecution, you know, to be beat into, 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 into submission for them to love God. They just have an, a, an, a, an affiliation, a mutual, uh, you know, love agreement with him without a lot of, you know, coxing, as I said earlier on. So these are the kind of people, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. It says that Jesus came first, 
you know, to carry our burdens for the remission of our sins. But he is going to come again the second time. This time not to carry away sins, not to remove our burdens. But he says that he is coming to appear to those that are eagerly waiting for him. I like the Amplified Version. If you read the Amplified Version, that's Hebrews chapter 9, verse 20. This time he's coming the second time. The first time he came, he died on the cross, you know, re rose from the dead and was taken, was caught up into glory. But he's coming again a second time. Why? To those that are eagerly waiting patiently for him. Those are waiting and watching his appearing. Those are the ones that he's coming unto. Second Timothy again, chapter 4 from verse 8, verse, from verse 7, verse 8. Okay, Paul is speaking to Timothy and said, I fought the good fight of faith. I finished my course, I finished my race and I kept the faith. Then he goes on to say in verses that now what awaits for me is a crown of glory, which the Lord has kept for me on that great day, which great day, the day of his appearing, which the Lord himself has kept for me. And he says, not only for me, but he says, but all those who are earnestly waiting for his appearing, who are eagerly wanting his appearing, those are also the ones that he's also going to give a reward on. Okay? It's a command, folks. It's a command. It's a posture. It's a spiritual conditioning that we must have. Read the scriptures that I'm just throwing at you. Revelation chapter 3, verse 3, the most common one that we all know. That, you know, watch. If you do not watch, I'll come upon you at a time that you're not aware. You know, therefore, if you will not watch, I will surprise you. And then you will be left behind because you're not watching. And then Thessalonians tells us about that. You know, I'll come like a thief in the night. A thief to those that are not expecting. But if you are expecting and anticipating, nothing comes to you as a surprise. You know, if you look at the story of Elijah and Elisha, Elijah knew the day that he was going, the prophet, the sons, not even the prophets themselves, the sons of the prophets knew even the day. Elisha knew the day that Elijah would be raptured. Can you imagine that? They saw it coming because they were in constant coming. I said yesterday that... God gives everything to us precept upon precept, line upon line, a little here, a little there. Why? So that we gradually come into this alignment, come into this understanding. So God makes sure that we are climbing a ladder where I can tell the progress and when I can see so that I can also even predict that all oh, three steps are going to look like this. Because I'm looking from where I've come from. I'm looking in hindsight and I can tell that these are God's dealings and these are God's ways in me. God's ways are like this. I've been walking in them. And so I have the pattern. I have the understanding of the process that God uses in this particular situation. So it's line upon line, precept upon precept. So that by the time I get there, I am mature. I am I'm wise. I understand how things ought to work. And then I engage myself according to God's purpose. The whole reason why the process is there is so that when I get there, I'm wiser, I'm mature, I'm able to carry out God's assignment because the process taught me and I had to be patient, I had to be disciplined, I had to work out my salvation, I had to do all those things that were necessary so that I could come to a place of realization and knowledge and wisdom and maturity so that I'm able to carry out God's work. Okay, so this is why it is necessary that we know line upon line, precept upon precept. Then it's easy even for us to predict because now we can see what is what is going to take place. We don't just sort of wake up and then, oh, it all happened. I don't even know how I got there. Imagine if you were to sleep for 20 years and then you'd wake up and then suddenly the world has moved on. And by the time you had gone to sleep, you, you, you didn't know that there were cell phones and laptops. You are going to struggle. You are going to struggle to catch up. You're going to struggle to know how to use a phone because you missed the process. That's how God operates. Okay, so let's. So God is saying when he says watch therefore because if you don't watch, I will come at a time that you least expect and I'll take you by surprise and you'll be left behind because you are not anticipating. I've noticed something that the Lord only responds when you are asking, when you are pleading, when you are seeking. God never just sort of like, you know, uh, you know randomly, oh, I don't even know what just happened you know, kind of thing, kind of scenario. But we have this assumption that, you know, it just will happen anyway when it wants to happen. You know, there's what we call grace and mercy. That's a different thing altogether that I'm talking about. I am talking about when you are on a journey, 
when you are on a road, when you know that you're a pilgrim and a sojourner, when you know that you are going somewhere with the Lord, when you know that there's a process and there's a road and a route that you must take, and you see signposts because it's showing you where you are and, and how are you almost there? You know, it tells you because you can't just be walking on a journey and not know that are you there or not. Okay, so we have these scriptures to show us, to, to help us understand that we are given an instruction to know, to look for his return. I'm going to read again the book of uh, Songs of Solomon because I love it. It's been really playing a lot in my spirit. Second uh, chapter of Songs of Solomon, verse 8. The voice of, this is the Shunammite woman speaking concerning her lover, concerning, let's just put it this way, the church, how the church is yearning for the return of the Lord. Let's just put it in this context here. The voice of my beloved. Behold, he cometh. The voice of my beloved. The Lord is coming. I'm just paraphrasing. He cometh upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a raw oil, like a, a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He's looking forth at the windows, showing himself through lattice. It's like almost like the Lord just peeping through us the sky and says, are you ready for me? I'm about to come now. Are you ready for me? Can you receive me now? And my beloved spake and said unto me, rise up my love, rise up my love, my fair one, and come away. This is him speaking, saying to the church, rise up my church, come away, come to be with me. Um, rise up my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past and rain is over and gone. Winter speaks of the tough, you know, terrible, terrible times. He's, he's saying here, the winter is past. The rain is ended. What's happening now? The flowers appear on the earth and the time of singing of birds is come and the voice of the turtle is heard in the land. That is speaking of a new season, a new posture to say the tough times about over. I'm about to take you. Come away with me. Rise up. Be in the right posture. I'm going to take you and I'm coming to rescue you now. Okay. So the time of your mourning is coming to an end. The time of your trouble is coming to an end. Revelation chapter 3 verse from verse 8 to verse 10, 11, 12, which talks about that you... Uh, you, you've been faithful. You have been patient with the word of my patience. You, are, you have not rejected my name, even though you had little strength, but you held on. And therefore, I, verse 10, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is coming upon the face of the earth to try them that dwell upon the earth. You know, for you, it's going to be a, a, a season, a summer is coming for you. The flowers are appearing on the earth. The time of singing of birds is coming. The voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. This is the Lord speaking to the church. Come away, get ready. Things about to get good. We are getting into summer. We are getting into the marriage. Hallelujah. I feel the anointing somebody. Woo, you know. Verse 14. Oh, my dove, thou art in the clefts of the rock. This is her now speaking to him. Oh, my dove, thou art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance. Let me hear your voice, for sweet is thy voice and thy countenance is calmly. She's saying to him, you are hiding there from me in the glory. Come now, let me see you. Let me hear you. I long to be with you. Hallelujah. This is a perfect love story. The one that the church and the Lord Jesus Christ has or should have. The way you look at it. Okay. So, saints of the Most High God, we have come to that time, to that place where the catching away of the bride is imminent. We are seeing the signs. We're seeing what is happening. I gave a, a, a prophetic message a month ago plus that I spoke that there's judgment coming to America. Go and check on my YouTube videos. It should be the fourth one from this one. I spoke about that judgment is coming to America and to the world. Uh, we are beginning to see this. Um, the death of George Floyd, I believe, is a trigger to something that is going to ricochet and is going to gain momentum. We'll see. We'll watch the spaces. But either way, the world is in turmoil. There's perplexity. There's confusion. There's pain. There's hopelessness. People have lost jobs. The economies are crushing. Coronavirus is going crazy. It's a perfect storm. Climate is changing. Everything is gathering together. We are seeing the signs that the Bible tells us about the end times. That is why I'm doing these messages because I don't want you 
to miss glory. I don't want you to miss the rapture of the church. God showed me things that are wicked that are coming after the rapture of the church. There's going to be alien invasion. There's going to be, governments are going to be cruel. You think we're seeing cruelty now? It hasn't even begun. People are going to die everywhere. People, are, people won't care about dead bodies. People will jump dead bodies. God has shown me in dreams how the state of the world would look like after the rapture of the church has occurred. Running to the sheep. Noah went into the ark seven days prior to the rain. That was the time of his posture. We are in the time of the posture that the posture must be correct and aligned to God's purposes into the entrance of the glory. I love you folks and I bless you in the mighty name of Yeshua, our soon coming Messiah. Until we speak again, Shalom.